Are we okay? <clears throat> okay. Take two. And my, take two. Okay. Uh, I'll only wasted four minutes. Uh, I know I call me to order. I approve the minutes from October 9th, but there are some questions. Yeah, some questions. Uh, seeing as you're raised at the last meeting, the, the people, the, the person who made a motion and the person who seconded it are not identified. And I checked it, well, the rules, I checked a couple of other sources, and then I will say they have to, the minutes have to name the person who made yes. every motion, the person who seconded it. And in fact, and uh, if it's not unanimous, then you have to identify who is the vote. And Chitsumi and I actually had a discussion about that. So what we ask is that when every, anybody makes a motion and you identify them because the name tags on the table didn't work. Okay. And, um, and Frank, Frank, just so you're aware, I think I edited the minutes and sent them back to Helen with most of the details on who made the motion and seconded it from my notes. You put it in your notes. So I can forward that. We put it in the minutes to... She always sends us the minutes and asks us to make yeah. any edits. And... So you should be able. So we it shouldn't be a problem in the sense that we don't need to identify ourselves because you identify us in your minutes, in your notes. No, I'm. This was a one-off where I think we came out of executive <laughs> session, <laughs> and I yeah. noticed that the Telesco person was not on, so I jotted down who made the motions. Okay. For if this, you, if you'd like us to, we're happy to take it back up to that. Yeah, could you be? Would you mind being the backup only because? Yeah, you no, know, it's sure be easier. In your in your corrections, did you know Callum is misspelled on page two? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, probably not. <laughs> okay. We, um, I also recall when when we. We, we approve the minutes as corrected, not just approve the minutes. Right, as corrected. Yeah, and that should be in there. That should be in there too. And then the, the, at the, the very end, it says the meeting adjourned at 721 P48. P48, yeah, I noticed yeah. that. It was like, I don't know what, I think we're 748. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, we had two meetings at a time. But the same thing, there was a motion to adjourn and it didn't say it. I don't think I moved to adjourn. And, and right, right there's a second right there. Got my you name. Got your name, your name. And, and you know, your chance to have your name in the minutes yeah. and, and it blew it. Blew it. <laughs> <laughs> there might be the end of it. Okay. So with those, with well, those. I'm moving to approve the minutes with those corrections. With those corrections. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. That's the unanimous. Public comment? There's no public comment. Um, we're going to move ahead. Is Tina here for um, to, to go over the the uh, applications for pensions? I don't see her on yet. Um, I don't believe that's Tina. I believe that might be Telesco. Okay. If so, she is in here, then we're going to move up. Okay. Well, so we don't know where. Oh, actually, that is Tina. Hold on. I will add her. We have a, we do have a question about, oh, okay. I think Charlie and I both agree that we should know. Yeah, that's Tina. Okay. Yeah, that's Tina. I, I think we could. <clears throat> I mean, usually she would review it. And, um, Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm That's okay. Um, I'm driving in the car. Not to, Helen's husband passed away on Sunday. Um, and so I am driving to the memorial service right now. So I apologize that I'm not on video. And that's why I called in instead of going in through the webinar because I'm I couldn't figure it out. So I'm so sorry. Um, well, I, I, I don't know whether you got the, I sent you an email in regards to, um, one of the pensions and that the gentleman was married that, um, <clears throat> I didn't know whether or not there was anything that, um, there's been times on occasion where we get a letter that says um, 
the, the ex spouse either renounces any claim to the pension or or, or has, or, a, claim or has for a certain amount of money. Has yeah. a certain amount of money. So yeah. and uh and because he used his his yeah. marriage license for his for his age, we know he was married yeah. and, and we know that since his um the, the, the person who's gonna receive the funds if he passes his his girlfriend, either he's very aggressive or else he's probably divorced. So therefore, we're just trying to find out if you know anything about that pension. No, all I know is that we've reached out to him. We haven't heard back yet, but we've indicated that under the pension document, his girlfriend would not be, um, I don't, there does not appear to be a quadro or a qualified domestic relations order in the file. Um, so we have reached out to him to let him know that his girlfriend would not be an eligible beneficiary under the plan. Uh, but we did not hear back from him today. So uh, if you want to table this one, I'm, we're just, we can either table this one um, and I'll continue to follow up with him or we can approve it um, with the stipulation that he amends his beneficiary information. Well, I, I think the consensus is that we'll table that. We need a motion. Yeah, we need a motion. Okay, so I move we table the application of the uh, uh, Mark Campanello. Yeah. Uh, Richard Baskin seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Proudly. <Yeah. laughs> Do you have a middle initial? No. <laughs> um, okay. There's a motion. Uh, second. Seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> no. So that that pension we, we table. Okay. So next meeting. Okay. Okay, and so if you want to then review the other pension application, and then we can just vote. Sure. Over. Yep, so we have one additional pension application for today. Uh, the pensioner's name is James McFadden. He is from the Board of Education. He was a custodian. He was with the Board of Education for 21 years. Uh, his uh, commencement date would be August 28th of 2004. Uh, he is requesting a normal pension and he has selected option one. And we would uh, ask for approval of this pension application. Is there any discussion on this pension? Is there any problems with this? So I move we approve it. Second? I'll second. Hendrickson, second. Second, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. You want to go get black off? Yeah, do it. Writing down my names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got room for them? Where do you think? Yeah. Well, I just sit at the end and I can Perfect. shift over to the side. Mm -hmm. I know I've been busy decks, but we also have decks. I think we have all have all have a thing. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, quick introductions off the bat. My name is Reed Dillon. Um, I'm a relationship manager at BlackRock, working within America's institutional business. So I cover consultants and institutional clients across all different client types. So 401k, um, pension, uh, foundation endowment. Um, so I'm here to help save Norwalk and Callan as we walk you through our EMAT strategy, which off the bat, I do want to just thank you guys for the continued partnership um, in our emerging markets off the tilts fund. I also know you guys are invested in the Russell 1000 index fund as well. So thank you for the continued partnership across 
all asset classes. Um, we'd really appreciate it. Um, just quickly introduce, introducing, this is Henry Shen. He's a senior product strategist on our systematic active equities team. Um, he leads our emerging markets relationships, like when it comes to the EM market as well as the China market. He's the specialist on our systematic equity team. So he will give you the spiel um, covering people, process, and performance. Um, and if there's any questions off the bat, we're happy to address those initially, or um, we're happy to just dive in. Okay. Right. Do you know kind of a time check? Is it uh, how much time? Half hour, half hour, half hour, hour. Yeah. Half hour or whatever. Okay. It could, it could be less if nobody has questions. It could be more if we find out the total things <laughs> 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 Sounds good. Yeah, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, and then, right, according to Reed, uh, thank you for the continued confidence in, in, in this particular capability. Uh, I've been with the team at this firm for 13 years now, uh, and you know we're part of a group. If you could look look at page four and five of the presentation deck, we can start with page four. We manage around north of 210 billion U.S. dollars today, majority in long only active strategy, running anywhere between one percent active risk to three percent active risk attempting to essentially beat the respective markets and benchmark in a consistent and differentiated manner. Page five here highlights kind of the milestones of our history. Based in San Francisco, we're at the heart of a lot of the new technology developments and over the years, really inundated with adopting new techniques, using new data to help you inform to make systematic, unbiased investment decisions. So the process here is all, 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 always about machine plus humans and trying to make these scientific based investment decisions in a scaled manner. So we adopt this not just in emerging markets, we adopt this across global equity markets in US, large cap, small cap, in China and Japan, everywhere in the world. I've been doing this for 39 years now. Our first strategy, which was launched in 1985, still in existence running today against the S&P 500. For the emerging market alpha two strategies, we've launched this in uh, 2008. So also, you know, close to 20 years in China. Let's go to page six here. The team has been very stable. So you will see here on the overall group where north of 100 people cutting across investment research, portfolio management, and investment strategy. The leadership group here, average tenure is 18 years. The last five years turnover has been 3%. So we've been a pretty boring group in the sense that there's not a lot of changes. The team and leadership has been stable. Um, I'm actually one of the more junior members and it comes to leadership and tenure on, on a group. But as Reed, as Reed mentioned, I'm the lead portfolio and investment strategist for everything relating to our emerging markets, Asia Pacific and, and China investment models. So certainly um, any questions relating to emerging markets whether it's markets or investment insights, happy to address them. <clears throat> Part of that investment team also contains a partnership with Stanford University since 2017. So we do have a, a, a Palo Alto Artificial Intelligence Lab where we work with five tenure professors in adopting some of the latest and greatest statistical and machine learning techniques and optimization techniques to enhance our investment process. So. That's been a, a, a great work in progress and we've used that to enhance many of uh, parts of our model. And the reason we continue to pursue innovation is in the alpha game. If you wanna maintain and continue to deliver consistent alpha and differentiated alpha that's uncorrelated to our cell market, you actually need to continue to innovate because ideas do get well understood. Data get uh, ubiquitized over time. And so these are things that we constantly pursue. Would you say you're the the leader in use of AI in investment decision making? I would say we are a leader when it comes to the time horizon we're active in. So we blend longer term fundamentals, so six to eight months forecast, really focusing about the expected earnings per share in a cross section, and we blend that with shorter term one to five month we we'll call sentiment forecast, understanding for each stock, all different type of investors, what's their expected buy and sell intention i.e. what's the expected P multiple expansion and contraction really re pertaining to that stock by each individual investor. Blending the both, which makes us kind of intra-quarter, <clears throat> three to four month forecast horizon in that space, we're undoubtedly, you know, lead leader or one of the leaders in this industry globally. 
um, if you just work in kind of intraday high frequency space, that space is already consolidated. Mm -hmm. There's a few proof players. Yeah. And I would say yeah. longer term, where you know, 12 months out, 24 months out, fundamental judgment and human yeah. creativity, that still comes, you know, kind of, they're, they're still fragmented, they're big players there. But for us to consistently work and deliver alpha in high information ratio, so risk adjusted returns in that space, I would say we're definitely one of the- hey, What's your information? Was it less than a year? Yeah, three to four months. Three to four months. Yeah. So equivalent of about 100 to 150% turnover per year. So that's kind of the way we, we operate. Are, are any of your trades now fully automated where there's no human like intervening before trades executed? Yeah, so so you know, you can think our, our our researchers, they don't cover stocks. They are subject matter experts, either machine learning experts, large language model LM like chat GPT, uh prompt engineers, or a combination of that plus econometrics, accounting finance. Our portfolio managers, they are model managers. They mm -hmm. design and pick what inputs we call signals, essentially their algorithms, mm -hmm. will go into a given model. You know, what works in emerging markets will be very different than what works in US large cap. And so the makeup of underlying signals and the relative importance of the underlying signals will also vary. And so the human judgment comes into deciding and using different empirics to understand for what micro, micro market microstructure, what type of ideas work. And once you decide that, you rarely intervene downstream. So the model will decide every single day what stocks to buy and sell. And we'll decide the friction of implementing those costs. And if it's too high to implement those costs, naturally will not trade because the, for, if the forecast alpha does not exceed that that cost of tra trading. Mm -hmm. It does not uh, uh, does not transact. We only intervene when there are significant off model events from a risk management perspective. Mm -hmm. It's not like oh today you know Samsung had a big detraction today, uh, the Korean stock. Korean market overall was down over 4% every mm -hmm. single day today, big, one of the biggest drawdowns year to date. Um, it's not like we saw that market down. We we step in and say, hey, uh, because of my human intuition and judgment, I decided to that. That's a big no-no. The whole point is to make it uh, unbiased and objective and empirically and statistically driven um, based on the research we've done prior. Um, the only one I can think of in recent years where we stepped in was the Russia-Ukraine war because the model was not aware there were 100,000 troops at the border in, in February of 20, you know, 2020, uh, 2022. And fundamentals look great in Russia. Mm -hmm. Things are very cheap. So from a modeling perspective, you know, insights really like Russia, but it, it was not aware of those things. Maybe you changed it, but I saw I saw somewhere later that news mm -hmm. sources was one, was one of the inputs into the AI algorithm. Yep. So it wasn't around when the Ukraine war started or? New sources was, but new sources and like actually brokers and analysts when they write about Russian mm -hmm. stocks, I mean, that was a source of concern and consideration. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the way our process work is diversification in not just the number of stocks we hold, but number of ideas we hold. The number of ideas are spanned across typically mm -hmm. 120 different ideas, mm -hmm. 120 different signals that would formulate the three major insights, so fundamental sentiment and macro thematics. I would say some Russian stocks will get negative sentiment scores based on news, uh, based on analyst coverage and analyst textual representation. But by and large, like the valuation aspect look fantastic. Uh, oil reserves, commodities, pricing fund for projected fundamentals still very still, still look very strong in January 2022. So that, mm -hmm. those were the instances. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We had a did we have a Russian nickel stock? Right. You yep. now worth less than nickel. Yeah. How do you how do you think about within the same context then? How do you think about China yeah. um as yeah. it relates to either you know from a similar standpoint, yeah, potential invasion of Taiwan or just Chinese yeah. government interference on numerous levels? Yeah. Something that the model can't. Yeah. I, I would say the fact and, and part of you know, I would say recent three year relative weakness. I mean, we've been flat year to date, you know, through yesterday, we're up around a percent, which is lower than average annual alpha delivery for us from a 10 year annualized basis. I would say that a big contributor is the fact that you have the largest economy, which is China, being flip flopping on their stance. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of these are, you, you can't possibly forecast these things. You can 
kind of do a best guess estimation, but really only about eight people surrounding Xi Jinping would know what's the next thing he would impose, whether it's common prosperity reform or, you know, all of a sudden uh, put a salary cap on the financial industry professionals that basically, you know, wiped out half of the, the, the talent in China. Those things are very hard to predict. And the best we can do is that the fast moving and the dice model react to these changes. We can't really anticipate those. But what we can do is when you know, because in our process, it's not just a return forecast. If you go to page 10, as part of our investment process, the biggest and fastest decaying component of our return forecast will be that effective stock selection or price forecasting component. That's a part that is most competitive. That's a less than zero sum game. Um, and so we're always innovating for that part. But the risk component is also crucially important. So you want to take only compensated risk in your trades. And the risk component is ingested through a customized risk model. Uh, we customize from the bar risk, uh, risk modeling framework. And the risk modeling framework is a mechanical setup. It's some degree of half-life based on the covariance matrix. And you know when a particular big news, let's say a war or an un unexpected policy announcement came through, it's going to bring about higher volatility than what the risk model is estimating. So what we can do is we can tighten the guardrails around mm -hmm. Chinese stocks. We can tighten the guardrails around Russian stocks all the way to zero so it doesn't take any active bets. And that's the way we contain X ante, so heading in versus heading out in terms of that risk management. Well, because we had a, an event last week that, um, how did you... How did you respond to that? I mean, AI was in with yeah. Is there? Is there? You know, I mean, it, now that is there, you know, the, the gentleman who's going to the president is talked yes. about, you know, um, seriously. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Did you respond to that prior to the election, post election? How how did you look at that? So on the election risks, most of the time, historically especially emerging market election risks, we want to we want to trade into political risks empirically because most of these political risks don't materialize and are actually good alpha sources because people oversell these things. U.S. election is the one exception <laughs> where we actually actively uh, have an election dashboard and election prediction model that includes the prediction markets or betting markets plus super pollsters plus polls plus uh, you know, uh, federal election contributions. So we have all these things that basically we did have Trump winning, uh, but it was like a very, very small margin. And the margin error, basically, it's a flip of coin based on what the model. But based on those probability mm -hmm. models, we have essentially a winner's and loser's basket associated with each candidate. So we are actually underweight China because of the tariff impact. And actually, if you look across the hood in China, um, the average Chinese stock only has about 5% sales exposure to the U.S. So it's not a big deal, right? So if you look at what has happened in the last 10 days, and our performance has been quite good in the last 10 days post-election, is the investor focus, because everyone's talking about U.S. tariff, 60% to China. It's about the 200 or so, or so stocks that has 25% plus in exports to the U.S. that are at risk. It's those names that are being sold off. The others... The names that have domestic majority, but domestic sales exposure to Chinese economy, those are actually done fairly well. Plus, you have you know the national National People's Congress that just announced a ten trillion yuan housing stimulus or or you know real estate stimulus package with more to come. Actually, the rest of the market has done okay, and so it's about understanding what's the real exposure as opposed to headline tariffs. Isn't it potentially more bailout than it is an investment? Yeah, yeah, bailout. Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely bailout. It's a bond program. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think with that in mind, I think I will just cover a few things I think are interesting. Um, you know, page 17 has a quick emerging market review for the third quarter, which does feel like a lifetime ago. Uh, a few things just to point out is I, I, I do want to bring about your attention on page 17, top left-hand side. You will see 
emerging market as a total return from a year to date basis, which is indicated in the red line here, has more or less caught up to the developed market space. And all of that is spurred by the China bazooka on September 24th, which announced a joint announcement between the Ministry of Finance as well as this, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the Central Bank of, of China, PBOC, around a fiscal stimulus promise, which actually ultimately was announced last week, but was preceded by uh, monetary stimulus as well as housing support when it comes to and capital markets programs, uh, which includes the national team, which, which are essentially state-owned brokers and fund houses buying excessive amount of Chinese securities into that space. And so that did spur a big part of that red line catching up to developed market performance. Um, and so that really flipped the coin because China has been the worst performing emerging market country for a long time. And now, now if you look at the bottom left-hand side, they're in one of the leaders, so certainly the second, but you, the yellow dot is the year-to-date through September end. And you see Q3 was one of the, the top leading positions. So that that does flip uh, the EM country ordinal ranking uh, around its head. There's so many countries you're in. How do you deal with currency yeah. transactions? Do yeah. you base things, you know, uh, on like the piling in the bot or yeah. whatever? Or yeah. How, how do you do, do you hedge? So, so, so we do have signals in the model that looks at currency effects to sales on a stock by stock basis. So if you're importer versus exporter, the your own home currency relative to the dollar or the, 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 the broad currency basket will have impact to what your expected revenue will be. So that will be one of the fundamental signals we do. Aside from that, broad currency moves, it will be aligned with what the benchmark is. So our, our goal is just to deliver you alpha, right, above the benchmark and that will float. So we don't really hedge back the currency. We do have clients and we do have portfolios where they want everything to be hedged back to US dollar actually or other home currencies. We do a few in Singapore dollars for Asian clients, Singapore clients, but most of the time it's just going to be float based on what the benchmark. So the benchmark is US dollar unhedged. The portfolio itself is unhedged based on US dollars. Do, do you think back to China for a second, do you think no. What they did in September is an increase, you know, production in GDP, or is it just kind of an inflationary goose? They, they well, they're, they're, yeah. So, yeah, great question. So, mm -hmm. it's going to push away from deflationary spiral or mm -hmm. maybe onset of def a deflationary spiral. So, that's a good thing. So, it's going to push for some inflationary pressure in China. They are targeting for a 5% GDP growth for the 2024. Uh, fiscal calendar year, same for next year. Those are the targets, and when they say they will hit the target, they will they will hit the target. Um, no matter sure. the the yeah. whether it's real or not, the print yeah. will be five yeah. percent. It will be bare, just as. And so, and and actually, like earnings, be five ten. <laughs> yeah, earnings earnings for Chinese stock has been one where, if you look at Alibaba, like six consecutive earnings growth. Stock is down forty percent until September, right? No one cared because that was the the yeah. big off model thing, you know, like you know, big event that's driving everything. Which I think explained a bit of that kind of weakness in our alpha performance because we are a diverse, diversified set of ideas, and a lot of Chinese stocks people didn't care about the fundamentals, and so they're just selling down because of this geopolitical risk. We have some modeling around that, but there's only so much you can do, right? And so I think that's a part where, yeah, I think we're doing okay now. We're up a percent, but I think if you look at three-year, look at five-year, we're essentially flat, which I think if you look across the broader platform for us, we've been extremely strong in developed markets, extremely strong in just China alone because we can manage that risk specifically. Um, very strong in Europe, very strong in ACWI. And so, if, in fact, of 211 billion, AUM we manage, 88% uh, of our assets have beaten the market medium um, in terms of peers um, in the last five years. In the last one year, it's like 92, 93%. So I think the model is model is, work, is working well. Um, and it's the emerging market component that's like relatively weak in, in the, in the cross-section of all our models. Yeah. Okay. One, one, 
One last point I think is very important, and I'll open up to questions. And as you know, I have limited time, is page 18. If you think about the big comparison between developed markets and emerging markets today from a stylistic perspective, so whether it's value-oriented environment or growth mm -hmm. environment, a growth-oriented environment, um, I would say if you look at uh, the bottom right-hand side, that is the most extreme. So the value growth comparison between emerging markets is shown in the orange line, whereas in developed markets is shown in the gray line. So as we all know, the, the developed market has been a growth environment where growth stocks have outpaced value stocks yeah. significantly uh, in the last, uh, I would say, year and a half, close to two years. And that's really triggered by, you know, call it the Max 7 or the Gen AI story that's taken U.S. and global investor by storm in the developed market space. You really don't see that effect in the emerging market space, where in the emerging market space, call it coincidence, call it, you know, all the policy interruptions from China has resulted in the emerging market space still being a very, very value driven market. So that's been a space where that's uniquely different compared to developed market space. And that translates to many type of ideas. Um, you want to play a bit more defensive. You want to play a bit more quality. You want to buy stocks with good operating cash flow, uh, with decent margin clearance uh, that does accruals. Um, these are the ideas that have been consistently delivering alpha uh, in the cross-section of emerging markets so far. The MSCI Emerging Market Index, what percentage of your stocks are part of that index? Uh, so yeah, part of yeah. So on page thirty, you will see we will typically invest seventy five percent plus of our uh, market value in emerging market index constituents because the way we think about it is our model will express a propensity or a probability of outperforming or underperforming each asset in the investable universe, which obviously will include emerging market index constituents. We will include some stocks that are also emerging market stocks that are not in the EM index, but are you know well compensated if you consider even if you consider the the off benchmark bet. So these would be maybe smaller cap names. Maybe these would be names that are very very similar, but that have just mi missed the cusp of the MSCI EM inclusion. And so we will have some of those names. So this will be around eighty percent as of today. <laughs> Over the last five years, you've underperformed. What? Yeah. Why? Yeah. I would say a few. Uh, so last five years, our underperformance is 50 basis points. Uh, and this is as of September end, which has seen Q3 being a more difficult period. But if you kind of fast forward to today, I think the underperformance is going to be closer to kind of 40 something basis point. Okay. That that underperformance, I would say... 75. 70, actually 77. Post, post fees, yes. So I would say that that underperformance, about a third of that comes from India positions. India position in two ways. One is our country model. So aside from stock selection, we also time the country bets across. And we do not like India because it's overstretched in valuation. And there's immense amount of I would say, un, uh, non-alpha driven or exposure driven flows. A lot of ETF flows, a lot of passive, a lot of retail investors tally into India. And that <clears throat> empirically has been a good contrary insight for us to bet against these common popular flows. Plus it's too expensive. However, India has continued gone up. And part of it is because a lot of the flows has moved to India. And so I, th I think the model framework, we, 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 you know, we're a bit too slow to update that country model. And that's been a weak spot for us. And I think we're the first to admit country model has been extremely strong for us in the past. And it's been very weak for us in the last five years. I would say that's kind of culprit number one mm -hmm. on India, but India also, because the notional total return of India has increased dramatically. I mean, it increased, it's outpaced the broader MSCI EM index by 60% in the last four years. And during this time, India has also increased capital gains tax to India positions. And this is something, unless you are a French entity, a Singapore entity, or a Denmark entity, 
you do not get any tax breaks on cap gains tax, whether you're a sovereign wealth fund or a central bank or official institution or a public pension, you don't get any treaties. So even if you were to invest in an index fund, you would still incur roughly around 30 to 40 basis point of cost on tax uh, on capital gains tax itself. And so that's a very, very material part because of the rise of India representation in emerging markets. So we, we just have that headwind that we need to overcome. But nonetheless, I would say the country model framework has been weak. And then the other element is the flip-flopping around China stimulus that resulted in essentially the model being whipsawed when it comes to these, these specific positions. How do we see that tax? Is that tax part of the expense structure or how do we see that tax to us? To you, it's it's part of the total return and it's part of our alpha. Like we need to overcome. It's that. part of your alpha. So, so it's not built anywhere else in the fund statement, right? It's just in the total in return. Performance. Yeah. In the performance itself. Yeah. And so if, if you were to invest in uh, you, if you were to invest in any other index funds or active funds, mm -hmm. they would face the same same headwind essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we believe in diversity, diversifying our portfolio. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that emerging markets will, at some point, outperform say U.S. U.S. markets? It has in the last quarter, but not for <laughs> a very long, very 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 long time. So so I mean. Like the, the dream is always technology or emerging markets, right? And I think technology is real and it has captured global investors' attention and it has improved global productivity. I mean, we use, we, we've been using the cloud, we've been using AI, we've been using machine learning and not for the last 10 years. I mean, we see that. Um, emerging market is critical to that story. You think about, you know, I, I'm, I'm Taiwanese, so... You think about TSMC, you think about all the great companies, media tech, you think about all the supply chain that makes AI happen, that makes cloud computing happen. That's all there. That's all in emerging markets, whether you know, whether it's in Taiwan or Korea or even China or even South Africa. There are a lot of AI dependencies there. And if you look at emerging market, it's still ripe with growth opportunities. You have a mixture of you know, EM Asia. North and South Asia, and you have EM EMEA, which is you know shrinking, but you also have LATAM, which is commodity intensive, and they're tied to a lot of EV upstream production in, in terms of cobalt and, and others in Chile and, and, and Peru markets. So it does present great sources of diversification. And empirically, you want to have at least kind of eight to twelve percent of emerging markets in the total portfolio construct that will maximize the plan level sharp ratio and in information range. So, so I, I do think there is value. And, you know, I think, you know, think just want to appreciate for, for the long time commitment and, and patience into this strategy, but over the long run, and we have every confidence to, to say that we will continue to, to outperform the markets here. And we've been doing this for a very long time and, and there's no reason to think otherwise. Which countries in this list here, like on page three, really outperformed the markets over the last you know, 10 years? Taiwan. Taiwan has Korea. been, yeah, Taiwan has been. Korea has been a bit of uh, a bit volatile. So Taiwan in the cross section last 10 years, number one, followed by India. Um, and then I would say Korea, Brazil, Mexico, more recent. And then, yeah, I think the rest are kind of mixed right. bags. Yeah. You've been a very big part of the uh, index, right? Uh, which which one? Well, no. the, 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 the Taiwan's weighting in the MSCI or you know, index, emerging market index is not very big. You know, China's you know, what, 23, 24, so, 25%. So. And then you, you drop down to, um, uh, yeah, so, so so the so the ordinal ranking today is China is still number one. It used to be close to thirty five. It's now in the high twenties if you include China onshore and China offshore. Uh, and then Taiwan is now neck to neck with India. Both of these are close seconds, uh, and then Korea. Yeah, so those are the top four uh, top four country weights in MSCI. And they're now forty percent of the index or fifty. If you add those four, then it's a bit. It's closer to fifty. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, Saudi is one um, that's, you know, because you got a RAM code, but the free float is much yeah. smaller. And so that, that the way it goes into the, the, the uh, MSCI weight is less than seven and a half percent. So those are the biggest chunks. And you, you want, like Taiwan has very good alpha for us, continues to be the case, historically always the case. Um, Korea is a good funding pair with Taiwan. So we tend to underweight Korea, tend to avoid Taiwan, just purely on both the stock selection mm -hmm. side and country weighting side. And then you get other idiosyncrasies around, you know, Brazil, Mexico pairing. You have a little bit of the ASEAN around Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand. So you, you mix those in terms of how we think about groupings. But yeah, we, we do hold a diverse set of companies around 200 to 300 at a given point in terms of the portfolio holdings that will diversify those exposure. And we ensure we don't overexpose, right? You can see here on 30 top right, those are active weight relative to countries. It's never going to be more or less than 3% in active weight perspective. Do you have any problems with liquidity in some of these markets? Absolutely, but not in the large cap space that we operate in. And part of the consideration on portfolio construction is if we see a name that has low liquidity, the anticipated T cost is going to be, transaction cost is going to be very high, either both on explicit and implicit costs. So the implementation shortfall will drift positive very upwards. That in itself is a big <coughs> barrier or impediment for the model to implement those trades. Do so you, do you have restrictions as to how large a position you can have in any individual stock? Yes, so it will be plus minus 3% relative to the benchmark weight. So the largest weight today is TSMC. At one point during the third quarter, it was close to 12%. It's the largest single name it's ever gotten for good reasons. Uh, it's dipped back down a little bit. So the most we can do, let's say it was at 12%, it's 12 plus 3, 15%. But you know, we do like TSMC, continues to be a, be a, be a net overweight position for us. Um, but yeah. From your, your perspective, as an oversimplified question, but who, who's winning the AI war? The US is winning the AI war um, and a handful of companies. So artificial intelligence depends on what you want to see. Like if you're, if you're a model builder, so training different large language models, there's going to be five, six different permutations of large language model providers with their, they all with 800 to 1.2 billion of parameters. And they already sunk half a billion US to a billion plus US in training these models. Mm -hmm. So they are the foundation model providers that will then be adopted and they'll farm out commercially to BlackRock, to other financial service firms, other companies around the world, other industries. Then they will build their framework on top of it. Next time you call Domino's Pizza, it's going to be a it's, it's foundation model driven with Domino's own particular, you know, mm -hmm. pizza details yeah. um, that's going to, you know, improve their margins, improve their productivity and reduce their costs on customer service. So I think the winners foundation model is going to be one, but also the winners are going to be companies that can effectively use mm -hmm. AI to do those things, increase productivity, grab more market share or reduce costs. And there's a, there's a clear theme. I mean, the, and it's less evident in the, in the EM space. EM space, it's all about, right now at least, the suppliers, the, the chips, the things associated with the chips. Um, and DM side is already very clear, right, in the in the U.S. And the data centers have already been a big winner. Like Dell is actually a underdog because they thought, you know, it's, you know, computer makers, but actually have a huge data warehouse uh, business mm -hmm. that have been housing these uh, these AI components. Yeah. You said the United States is winning the war by a big margin, a narrow margin? How would you characterize that? It's a big margin because it's reducing and it's limiting access that China has to chips, mm -hmm. right? So TSMC cannot sell right. two nanometer below chips. And that is- They're, they're getting them anyway, right? Well, so. I think they can do like three and a half, <laughs> but in terms of- yeah. and the. the the thickness does matter because mm -hmm. it, it, it it limits how fast and how much right. you can train. And yep. so how accurate yep. these models are. Um, and so if you try a Chinese, Chinese version, large English model, it is not good. And it's mm -hmm. far from what GBT 4.0 can do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's okay. still, I, I think the U S is still leaps and bound ahead and they probably want to maintain that lead in any, any way, shape, form possible. So I think that's still, um, you know, at least right now, 
Yep. Okay. Probably the next five to 10 years. And also you think about the, not just public equity uh, allocation, but the private space, venture capital, private equity. Um, I know San Francisco from the news is a dead city, but you know there's like 20,000 square feet of office space um, open today and open AI just took up like half of it. And so I, I think that, you know, the AI space, you know, our office is downtown, like the San Francisco office downtown where I'm based, you can see it, you know, brimming with mm -hmm. AI excitement. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Rick, do you have any questions? No, I guess my one question would be, you know, obviously this process is, is done across various asset classes and benchmarks. I think, you know, I've met with you all on your U.S. mid-cap strategy and performance has been better. Is is there anything behind the model that is driving the intermediate and longer-term EM performance versus your other products with this SAE strategy? Yeah, I, I would say the, the biggest difference versus other models and other regional models. And you can see the performance very clearly on page seven, by the way, um, I know font small, so I might have to squint, is, is the lack of the country model I just mentioned. So the country model historically very, very effective for us in the EM space. That's been you know under punching its weight and that's actually been detracting a little bit. And you do get the fact that the heterogeneity, uh, the mix and match of different EM economies and EM country policies have presented more we'll call it off model risk risk that you cannot effectively predict or forecast based on empirics and so that's one that's been more of a wrench compared to other countries or other regional strategies and so that's kind of the i would say that, that that's the biggest difference yeah. the lar large language model like you're fine-tuning and customizing large language models so it can read broker text it can read conference calls it can read financial news better that's applied across every market that we operate in, and it's done very well in the U.S. Um, it's done, I would say, financial news-based LLM signals have done okay in in emerging markets. So that's also a, a, a spread where in emerging markets, not all companies are required to uh, conduct quarterly earnings calls. So you have less breadth in, in that yeah. occurrence. And so that's also another missing data link uh, that is, that's less comprehensive compared to U.S. markets. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Oh, one more then. Why'd you bring him? Yeah. <laughs> Reads my partner in crime. Yeah. Yes. I help with the travel. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's why he's here. But if you guys have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to address any other emails. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. Look at this table seven. <laughs> it's it's amazing. Well, all all they're doing here, and they're they're you know, they're squeaking out 75, 150 basis points. Yeah, but is that where the world's going? You well, know? no, my I mean, five my, years from now to to forty four countries. Yeah, my no my couple thousand my, my securities. My so. point on. Yeah, the point on it is that not delivering yet. No, it it if if you decide to make an allocation to let's say the the um, uh, Russell one thousand, and you can eke out an extra percentage point a year for twenty years. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of money. Right. And, and, and it's and it's um uh, seems like it's uh, it would certainly seem like they're investing in it you yeah. know and to get better and it and it looks like it's uh, um, uh repeatable and you can you can 
because I worked at a quant shop for eight or nine years and you can rent these up to higher tracking areas. But right now where we're at, the demand isn't there um, and you don't necessarily need to versus like, a you know, the way the public markets are going uh, to take on the additional risk here. But yeah, they can they can tweak them however which way they they want but i think this is they're telling you it's kind of like the sweet slot to your point like we don't have to go much further out to make a lot of money over the long term yeah, yeah. and i would add that the flows into the platform have been significant over the last five years uh not necessarily emerging markets version of it but uh small cap u.s equity uh certainly been a popular one especially for for dc plans across the industry yeah. Do you think that when we, after we have someone in, that we go to executive yeah, session to discuss thing. it? Yeah. Because so they can take a listen to this because, next month. Because it is, or a competitor someday could look back yeah. and, and look at it. Right. So I don't know what. I'm sure. I'm sure this is. is it might be. Knowledge. But, yeah. you, but, with, but with somebody's opinion right. here. Fine. Not, that, yeah. That's fine. Does anybody. Feel that one? Right. I, I agree with that. I was thinking sense. the same thing. Yeah, you so know, maybe, we ought to watch the conversation. Right. In the future, but, after we have somebody come in to discuss, mm -hmm. if we go to executive session, okay. then we finish the discussion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think just be kind of be cognizant of what you're saying in yeah. the public right. discussion because you don't want to go the other way and have too much of a conversation in the in the private executive session right. that shouldn't happen. You know, that should that should be public in nature. So just you know when when you when you're having the, the public conversation to um, you know say, say what say as much as you can say and then uh, then reserve what for executive session what should be for executive session. Right. I mean because remember we used to not have these recorders. <laughs> so it was easier we could have a a, a discussion without the concern in the wrong, maybe a competitor looks back and says, okay, a couple of years ago, this company was there. What were the discussions and what were the questions they had? So that's that's one of the reasons why yeah. possibly do that. We have, we have 4% of our portfolio with BlackRock. And I think the question is, um, is it should be more, should be less, or is it about right? It, it, it seems like the, the um, performance has been, you know, Okay, but kind of lackluster as compared to well, these two things are going to perform the index and the index the emerging markets are going to perform the United yeah. States. Yeah. Seems to me it's a it's a um it's a it's a lower of a a, a way to, to have exposure to emerging markets, which we should, from a di diversification point of view, without um, uh, really exposing us too much to a performance penalty. Yeah, right. And, and, and if you're going to be there, in my, in my opinion, you're going to be there in emerging markets, you know, this seems like a, a reasonable way of doing it other, you know, that we don't have some some uh, 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 you know, portfolio manager sticking his finger up in the air. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's it's yeah. we're not we're not likely grossly underperformed. Right, right, and, and we have an, here. And right. we have a decent chance of of right. of outperforming of by a by a, you know a percent a year. But I mean, it's, it's, it's. I guess it would be. Is it a market to be in? I mean, to put the money in bonds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's kind of like. Yeah, you know, you're you're you know, if you run the asset allocation models and if you if, 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 if throw it in there, it does reduce your your. Um, the variance, the, the variance, variance yeah. but you know, it, it's it's yeah. If you go back 10 the, years, what was, was it before China really kind of um, um, before they really kind of regained control of their, of their you know, 
of their decisions, and then they decided that uh, they're almost undercut the capital markets. What was it performing then? When, 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 um, well, they had, had a chart of uh, the, uh, I think, long term EM. Yeah, so why don't we go with the executive session? Okay. All right, just. You know, it's very, you know, it, it's easy enough. All we need to do is to is to Google MS. Performance review. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe just jumping to some, some macro real fast. We did see uh, stocks have another positive month in September. We had some... Um, economic momentum that, um, really fueling the, the continued bull market here. On the U.S. side, we finished up about 2.1%. Uh, Growth continued to outperform value by 1.4%. Small cap stocks, they were barely positive at around 0.7% for the month, um, continuing to kind of lag their large cap counterparts. And they're now trailing 10% year to date. So we kind of continue to wait for, for that um, cycle to kind of shift in small cap favor. And they catch up a lot. In, they catch up a lot in the summer when we had some of that sell off, right? Have they caught up in the last couple of weeks too? Um, they have, yes, they have. And there's a feeling that with you know the new president elect that that will continue to some extent um tbd around that but um i think the feeling is that we might see a little bit more of a of a bump there moving forward yeah and small caps usually we do get a little bit of like a santa claus rally at year end as well so um we'll keep an eye on that um globally we did see stocks returning 2.3 percent the ep was up um just shy of one percent as, as Britt mentioned, EM was up around 6.7% for for uh, the month there. And, and again, that was really just kind of that whipsaw rally in, in, in China. Um, U.S. economy grew by 3%, GDP grew by 3% for, for the second quarter. So that was some news that came out. Um, and we did see the, the Fed meet in September and um, they cut interest rates by 50 basis points. Uh, again, kind of feels like, you know, way in the past at this point in time, but, um, you know, they updated the Fed dot plot uh, survey and expectations of um, two more cuts of 25 basis points for the remainder of 2024. And as we sit now, we know that we did, in fact, get one of those, at least uh, one um, just a few days ago for 25 basis points. So, you know, we'll see if, if another cut comes before year end or not. But, um, you know, inflation is seemingly waning a little bit, um, but but um, keep an eye on things there. Uh, two year Treasury yield, which is, um, again, just kind of a proxy for short term market expectations that declined from three point six percent or excuse me, to three point six percent from three point nine percent. Long bond yields were also lower in September. 10-year yield was at 3.8 and the 30-year at 4.1. And then the only um, kind of outlier on the, you know, in terms of being in the red was uh, oil was down in September. Um, crude oil spot prices were down almost 9% to $68 a barrel. Um, we know, again, now kind of where we sit that we've seen that kind of uh, increase again. Um, Various reasons, but presidential uh, election certainly had a little bit to do with that in terms of his his uh, policies in, in that area. Um, so our expectations is that uh, you know that drop is is probably a thing of the past for the for the moment. Um, looking at the the total fund on on page one here, um, we see that again on an absolute basis, uh, the fund was up uh, it, now at the end of September, a value of 553,713,288. Uh, total fund was up just shy of 6% for fiscal year to date as of the end of September and outperforming its benchmark by 44 basis points. Still down on the three year by 11 basis points, but uh, uh, the five year on a relative basis is up 10 basis points. 
maybe just taking a look at um, a couple of, of managers I'll just call out here. The first of which um, to the negative side is, is LSV. They had a difficult month as well as quarter. Even though value actually outperformed in the third quarter, LSV themselves underperformed the benchmark by about 45 basis points of the month and 200 basis points for the quarter. Um, they note that while their stocks that were cheap on book value generally outperformed over the third quarter, stocks that were cheap on cash flow and earnings, which is what LSV favors, um, typically those underperformed small cap stocks. So that was a big reason there. Performance distribution also further indicated that stock selection and some of their sector, sector allocation um, were detractors from the portfolio's relative underperformance over, over the, the quarter, as, you know, inclusive of, of September there. Um, PIMCO, PIMCO all asset allocation was actually up 1.92% uh, in September. That they were outperforming the benchmark um, return of 0 0.63, so a performance of just shy of 130 basis points. Um, September and Q3, uh, excuse me, for Q3, they actually ended up outperforming by 220 basis points. They had positions in EM equities that contributed on the, the back of the, the rally coming out of China. So there's kind of another manager who actually um, capitalized on that, that um, bazooka, if you will. Uh, tips also were a contributor. We saw break-even rates rise across most of the curve. And then they did get some additional contribution from both REITs and MLPs, which performed in line with the, the broader return in equities. The last one that I'll mention here, um, Silchester on the international side, they were a strong performer for both the month and the quarter on an absolute as well as a relative basis. They outperformed the index by 100 basis points um, during the third quarter. They really just kind of stick to their knitting, as, as I'm sure uh, most folks at the table know, because they've heard from them for a number of years now. They're really just looking for businesses that have those kind of call it competitive advantages or, or moats at the end of the day. Um, they mentioned two new purchases. One is a company called Nutrien. They are the largest global provider of crop fertilizer. Uh, and if you know anything about that space, um, really strong barriers to entry. Um, you know, a lot of it is dependent on scarce deposits. So they like that business. Um, Swatch Group was another one that they added. Uh, and it's typically a company that you might think that they would shy away from because it's in some respects, it, people might think it falls into like this fast fashion type of brand, uh, but they actually like it because it's truly more of a diversified brand and that they have on the low end, the $70 plastic watches, but then they also own high-end watch companies like Breguet, um, Blanc Pound. So then those sell to a much, much wealthier customer base. Um, they also have been seeing a lot of uh, contribution come from EM as they have some strong sales in that, that space as well. So uh, more like a diversified conglomerate, if you will, than fast fashion. Um, so, so that's been a, a nice performer in the portfolio as well. What's EM? Emerging markets. Right on. Sorry. Yeah. By the way, does everybody get the um, Silchester reports? Any uh, yeah. data monthly? No. I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you're newer to the board. So you should probably make sure that. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's all the comments I have prepared. I don't know if there's any other questions on the performance report. What about the, you said the email, I was the email out on um, LSP with the, the, like, the lawsuit? Yeah. Do you, you, you want to jeopardizing their, their management team or their. Yeah, I think <clears throat> so. For those who weren't able to read the email I sent out, essentially it was announced that four former employees are suing LSV. Uh, they were employee shareholders and believed that even though they resigned from LSV, they thought they were able to continue to own um, their shares within the firm. And uh, according to the lawsuit, LSV forced their ownership sale um, when they left the firm, um, 
it remains to be seen, you know, what this ultimately means. I think based on our research team's due diligence, um, you know, they are, it's unclear about what the outcome will be. It does certainly give some concerns into how the ownership structure was set up. I think from an investment team and process perspective, it's a, you know, quantitative strategy that no one individual is, is really going to disrupt, uh, in our opinion. Uh, so from that standpoint, we don't have any issues. I think it it's uh, a bit concerning that, you know, their ownership structure was not clearly articulated and that these former employees, you know, filed suit against the firm. Uh, whether they are in the right or the wrong, uh, I don't think we know at this point. Um, but we'll continue to to watch them closely and and keep the board updated of the litigation and and where it goes. By the way, that's a good question you asked because I was in contact with Brent about it and asked whether we should have it on the agenda. And so, if anybody at any time wants to put something on the agenda, they either contact me or me, both me and Brent. So we could get it on the agenda because mm -hmm. it's as he we in our discussions it was like there wasn't really much more that could be shared right. because we didn't know much more. Yeah. Okay. We probably can't disclose much more at this point anyway. Right. Um, and one, one is is that I had one last thing. Um, if you recall, at the last meeting we went into executive session and discussed. Uh, the manager fees uh, in the pension plan, and there was one manager in particular that uh, offered a lower fee share class, but there was a uh, a requirement. Uh, we went back to that manager. They're willing to waive it, which would essentially allow the plan to reduce the fees by 10 basis points, um, being vague on purpose uh, just because we're in public session. Um, but I will follow up with the board uh, with an email with the details and work with uh, Chitz May uh, if that is approved by the board. We could go back into executive session if you choose to do that. If you'd like to, it would it'll take two minutes. Two minutes. Yep. Okay. yep. Um, I saw that we got money from private equity. Is that right? I didn't think it was that much. I mean, it's private equity is down by 553,000. Is that a loss or is that, I thought it might be. Um, that should be a cash distribution. Yeah. Cash distribution. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're hoping. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if there's any cash needs. Uh, not at the moment. I mean, right now, uh, through September, we're at nine million, so that will get us through the end of the year. Okay. So, um, for the first quarter of the new year, twenty twenty five, we'll come to the board next month to ask around nine million. Okay. Perfect. Any other business? So, in the December meeting, we'll see the the end of October, and we'll have a view into November uh, in terms of in terms of where we are uh, performance wise yes yeah I can actually provide I we have we market can. data as of close yesterday if you'd like to hear it sure pulling it up here so month to date uh, S and P five hundred up four point nine percent quarter to date up about four percent. Uh, we have seen growth swing back into favor. Um, we have seen small caps and mid caps, particularly in the growth sector, outperform. I think small caps got a bump, uh, also due to the Fed decreasing uh, rates. Internationally, uh, the Acquiex US, which includes developed in the M markets, down 1.1% for the month and 6% for the quarter. Emerging markets, down 1.4% for the month 
and 5.8% for the quarter. Uh, we've seen a lot of volatility in interest rates, uh, certainly surrounding the election, uh, as well as the Fed. Third quarter, the Bloomberg aggregate was up 5.2%, month to date down about 40 basis points and down about 2.8% quarter to date. So very mixed performance uh, across broad asset classes uh, in the U.S., certainly continue, continues to uh, to outperform uh, the rest of the world. You have the where the total fund is on a fiscal year to date basis? I do not. I do not. Based on this, my guess is it's up a little bit more than the flash report that we looked at today. Yeah, pushing six maybe, okay. But okay. September was broadly a good month, and October was broadly a bad month. Do you have principal group even? We had principal in. Yeah. yeah. And month. what was the, the the feeling about their presentation? Uh, I think my notes actually. Yeah. Did they do anything other than talk about stock stories? You know, give our stocks. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear about something they they did well five years ago. Oh no, no. <laughs> Why not? What? <laughs> That's what they want to. Yeah. I am actually my my notes are bad. I mean, it was just basically we didn't <clears throat> learn anything. Great. You know, it's just kind of a review of review right off. Right. I mean, there wasn't anything like that was. Pressing. In fact, it was rather a short meeting. No drama. No drama. They reviewed some of the periods where they got kind of whipsawed um, based on the rally in that space. Um, I have to go back specifically and say like where in the portfolio it was, but kind of just talking through those periods that uh, there were a couple of like big drawdown periods on a relative basis that, that is has kind of uh dented their some of their longer term I, well, I remember we had some there was some concern about how they were going to uh how the merger with the principal group is going to work and whether the how stable they were going to be or if they're going to lose some talent or or there's, you know, they didn't to be honest, that wasn't a part of the discussion last month. And Britt and I have not heard like from Callan's side in terms of our manager research, the mm -hmm. diligence there, any concern about that. Okay. They haven't flagged anything. Britt, is that that's fair? I haven't heard anything as yeah. uh, I don't think I think if anything, it's allowed a lot of efficiencies for the team to focus on managing the portfolio. Um, you know, Cliff Fox was the the longtime lead PM who retired, I think, four years ago at this point. Um, so that was largely where the the overarching concern was. Uh, the rest of the team has been been stable. The key senior PMs have all been there for quite a long time, and no changes on that front. I mean, your performance seemed to be where where they fit right now in your overall small cap growth. Well, roster are they in the top of the group middle of the group i mean longer term certainly top quartile performance i think what's what's longer term five seven year periods okay um you know they've three year they're more in line with the benchmark underperformed by about a percent over the trailing 12 months so they you know, have have had some periods of underperformance, uh, as Kevin noted. Um, but if, they wouldn't. It's, it's your, in the, right now, though. If we were to do a, a a clean slate search, for instance, like they wouldn't be somebody that we would shortlist. Let's put it that way, because of the shorter term numbers. Well, how much should we pay them? What's their? Can we pull it up? Is it sixty or something? It was a little higher, wasn't it? Maybe they wrong.
I mean, we have as much with them as we have with the EM funds. And so, I mean, it's yeah, I, I won't disclose the fee publicly just because it's a yeah. separate account, but in terms of our fee analysis that we discussed last week, they're largely in line with median peers um, in that space. Okay. I think you open your sleep. That's just more money than the OS and the OSS himself perform a long period of time. That's mm -hmm. a point That's what I'm not sure of what you no, I mean, I'm just saying that it's just oh I know that the 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 uh you know so small cap is not even it hasn't done uh it's up 25 percent a year been flat in the last three years I'm just wondering whether whether uh since I missed the presentation well, what what was uh the overall impression because they haven't been been smoking since uh since them fox resigned so right Mm -hmm. um, one other thing is calendar uh, for next year. I looked it over. And there's no holidays that you know, no religious holidays or anything that would be a compromise. It. So, is there a motion to accept the uh, the calendar for next year's meetings? Can Hendrickson will motion to accept the calendar for 2025. I can use a second. Second, all in favor? Aye. Anyone other request? Is there a motion for adjourn? Uh, we were adjourned. Second. 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 Can we, can we yeah. Make yeah. us some it's names. Too late. Too late. <laughs> You're too late. Okay. Who, who, who were the names on the, on the last I'm one? Raleigh. 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 Okay, you made the motion. I, I, I wonder if it could be a tie for a second. <laughs> Anyways, motion adjourned. Right. Okay, you. got it. Thank Thank you. You. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Have a good night. Happy Thanksgiving. 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 Than